All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So today we're going to look at the book of Revelation. And my experience has been when it comes to teaching this book that students tend to fall in one of two kind of extreme camps. Either they're really afraid of the book and they never want to read it, they never want to deal with it at all, or their pastor seems to preach on it every single Sunday. Those are probably extremes we want to avoid. So what I want, at least out of today in the, in the next hour, is to get us a little bit more comfortable with the book uh, in a way that I think is historically responsible. So I want to at least approach this by asking the question, how would the original recipients of this book have understood its message? And I do think it actually has a message that was discernible by those uh, original readers. So uh, if at any point you have any questions or you've ever had a question about Revelation you want me to answer it, uh, I'm happy to do that. So just interrupt me at any time. That's fine. Um, but hopefully you'll be following along in your notes. Okay. All right, so I thought the best way just to approach this book is to kind of go through a who, what, where, when, why, and how. So that's kind of what, what we're doing. Um, the who is pretty simple. Uh, John actually tells us. And so the opening two verses, but one of the things you're going to notice, by the way, is that I'm going to present information to you, but I'm going to try to persuade you that what I'm telling you is right. Okay, I'm going to like, so, you know, think critically, think, you know, is, is this a convincing case or not? Uh, because if you go on the internet, there are all sorts of wacky and crazy things that are said about Revelation, most of which just aren't really historically um, defensible. So, uh, so again, just look, allow me to persuade you, and you can decide whether it's um, whether it makes sense or whether you think I'm lying to you. So, opening two verses uh, where it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John, there he is, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So you can kind of just look at this and see there's a hierarchy of how this was passed down. Okay, so it really started with God. God gave it to Jesus, okay? And Jesus sent it and communicated it by his angel, which is like a heavenly messenger, okay? And he gave it to John, and John took it and he wrote it to the seven churches, and the seven churches preserved it, copied it, and now we're reading it today at SMC. Okay, so God, Jesus, angel, John, seven churches, SMC. Okay, <laughs> there you go. You are, you, are, uh, <clears throat> you are the lucky beneficiaries of this. Okay, so who is John? Well, he seems to be a, a Christian prophet. Uh, he's obviously uh, a Christian. Uh, he's, you, you could probably make the case that he's a Jewish Christian because he's got a lot of familiarity with the Hebrew Bible. Uh, but uh, he clearly is functioning as a prophetic figure. What is a prophet? A prophet is just someone who speaks on behalf of God. God gives a message to the prophet, and the prophet speaks it to the people. It could be about the future, but not always. Generally, it's something that people need to hear in the present. Okay, so John gives a little bit of his autobiography in verses 9 through 11. He says, I, John... Your fellow, sorry, your brother and fellow partaker in three things. In the tribulation, the kingdom, and the perseverance, which are all in Jesus. In Jesus. Um, I was on the island called Patmos. Why? For a statement. Because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit. So I was having some sort of spiritual experience on the Lord's Day, a designation for the first day of the week, Sunday. And I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. And that, guess what? That trumpet is now talking. The trumpet is saying, write in a book, probably a scroll, uh, what you see and send it to the seven churches. Okay. Why did I say scroll? Because books weren't invented until like the second century. It's actually the early Christians that actually were involved with this. So what they did was they got tired of unrolling a scroll so often. So they would just cut it into pieces and they would kind of. Uh, sew it together and they would make a book. It's called a codex. Um, so it's, these are all, they're all scrolls. There are no books in the Bible. They're all scrolls. They're all, um, a safe there is a scroll. Um, the same, same word actually gets translated as scroll, but anyway, that's just kind of a, that's trivia for the next time you're on Jeopardy. Okay, so John had, he had an overwhelming visionary experience where he witnessed the resurrected Jesus, who, by the way, commissioned him to write to seven Asian churches. Why do I say seven Asian churches? Uh, answer, the reason is that the, this, this particular region in particular was what's called Asia Minor. 
Okay, modern day, it's the country of Turkey, uh, but it's not Asia in the way that we kind of think of Asia, modern day Asia, but they're, they're called the eight, seven Asian churches. Uh, he portrays himself as a sharer in persecution, God's reign slash rule, and the perseverance that are demonstrated by Jesus the model. There's a lot to unpack in this. So he says, I, John, I'm your brother and your fellow partaker. This is the word uh, koinonia. When we talk about koinonia, the, the sharing, kind of fellowshipping word. And I mentioned the three things. Tribulation, another way of kind of talking about persecution. Um, and the kingdom, which is just God's reign and rule. And then the way that you respond to tribulation or persecution in light of your hope of the kingdom is that you demonstrate perseverance. Perseverance, it might be translated in your translation as steadfastness. It effectively means in Revelation a nonviolent endurance, okay? And all of these things, by the way, are ways that uh, Jesus is kind of portrayed in Revelation as like the model that you're supposed to follow. I bet most people, when you think of the book of Revelation, you don't think of it as a book of discipleship that's meant to kind of encourage you to live a particular way. A lot of the ways that Revelation is kind of, kind of uh, portrayed today is like here's, here's a bunch of coded symbolic events that if you could just be smart mm -hmm. enough to figure them all out – you can pinpoint the exact date when Jesus is going to return. That's how, how most people uh, uh, read it. Uh, but I'm, here, I'm going to try to convince you out of that if that's, um, if that's uh, what you're convinced of. Okay. Um, in chapter 21, there's 22 chapters, uh, it says that he carried me away. This is an angel carried me, John, away in the spirit, another spiritual experience, to a great and high mountain. And he showed me, dot, 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 a city. The wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay, so John says, I am seeing the names of the 12 apostles. He doesn't say, I'm one of those. There's my name. It's right there. He actually distinguishes himself from the 12 apostles, okay? So although there's a big Christian tradition that kind of identifies the John as John the apostle, the son of Zebedee, he never calls himself an apostle. He never... Describes himself as the son of Zebedee. He distinguishes himself from the apostles. He acts like a Christian prophet. He doesn't walk around with the authority of an apostle. An apostle can basically say, I'm going to write to you and you need to listen to what I have to say. Um, but he has to kind of give this autobiography of like how he was commissioned, how Jesus showed up to him, and why people need to actually listen to him. He has to j demonstrate his own authority, which you wouldn't have to do if he's an apostle. So, again, I'm making a case. John's a pretty common name. Uh, in the first century. Uh, most common uh, female name in the first century based on uh, gravestones is actually Mary. So that's why there's like, what, three or four Marys in the New Testament, at least. Uh, okay, all right, so we got who, what. What is the book of Revelation? What is the book of Revelation? Well, we already looked at the, the very first verse. I want to focus on this word right here, communicated. He sent and communicated it uh, by his angel. Okay, so Revelation... The word for revelation is apocalypse, in Greek, the apokalypsis, okay? An apocalypse is just the unveiling and a revealing. That's basically what apocalypse means. It means an unveiling or revealing, okay? Uh, a, a bride that is about to get married, she has a veil, and then when the veil is taken off, she can see clearly, and people can see her clearly. That is an unveiling or revealing. You can almost call that an apocalypse, okay? So this is why it's often called the apocalypse of John or the revelation of John, uh, that's kind of what it, uh, what it means there. So Revelation is just the, the English translation of the Greek noun apocalypse. There's one thing that you, you absolutely must know leaving this class. The word apocalypse does not mean the end of the world. It doesn't mean that way. Okay? So you can impress your friends because a lot of people just kind of think, oh, the apocalypse is, is coming. You're thinking the revealing, the unveiling, what does that mean? You know, like, like every Monday I look forward to the email that reveals and unveils what the menu is going to be for lunch. That's a big deal to me. Okay, so remember it says that uh, he communicated it. He sent and communicated this revelation, this unveiling by his angel. But the word for communicated is probably not the best English translation because it really means to signify. To signify, which is basically a verbal form of communicating with signs and symbols. Signs and symbols, okay? Uh, and that's really, really important is that revelation is going to convey its message it actually has a narrative with protagonist and antagonist. It's going to do it with signs and symbols, okay? So if we could just figure out what these signs and symbols mean, then it's going to make a lot more sense, okay? 
And signs and symbols, you might think, well, that just complicates things a lot more. But actually, I think if you use signs and symbols effectively, you could be a much more effective communicator, okay? Because isn't it much more uh, interesting to listen to a lecture when someone actually has something up here for you to look at? Because anyone can just sit up here and talk to you, but if you can kind of break it into three dimensions and actually look at pictures and that sort of stuff, you're actually more interested in it, okay? So that's part of the, the literary strategy is to use signs and symbols to communicate uh, the message. And we actually use signs and symbols in our culture uh, today. We'll talk about this. Now, a really important point. The symbols and images were things that the original audience would be able to discern. It's probably one of the most important things you're going to hear me say today. They are things that the original audience would be able to discern. So if we're going to try to interpret Revelation as responsible, historically-minded interpreters, we have to ask the historical question, how would Christians at the end of the first century, living in Asia Minor, living under Greco-Roman rule, have understood these signs and symbols? Okay? And signs and symbols change meaning over time. There, there are some, uh, we'll look at some today, uh, some signs and symbols that 10 years ago didn't have the meaning that they do today. There are words that didn't have the meaning, you know, 10 years ago that, uh, you know, they change, change meaning over time. Where is he getting these signs and symbols? Well, he's got a pool of images. Obviously, there are several images from the Hebrew Bible, from the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus can be described as a sacrificial lamb. He just kind of says that, and he assumes that you know what he's talking about, because uh, that was very important for the uh, Jewish Passover. Obviously, images from early Christianity, uh, seeing Jesus being enthroned, uh, seeing Jesus as kind of a crucified and risen figure, uh, that, that's really important. And then clearly, everything in the first century has to be filtered through uh, the lens of the Greco-Roman Roman world. It's not uh, the background in the sense that it's just kind of back there and you just forget about it. It's just that's the lens through which you have to read everything, um, at least in that particular area of the world in the first century. It's a very, very important piece of context. Okay, all right. Uh, colors are also employed to enhance images. So if you see that faithful Christians in the book of Revelation are given not just a robe as a reward, but a white robe, would you think that that is a negative image or a positive image? Positive image, okay, all right. If you see a dragon that is a red, fiery dragon, is that a positive image or a negative image? Negative, negative. okay. So, so you, you see, but I don't have to tell you that. You can look at colors and be like, okay, I can discern that colors can be used to enhance meaning without me having to, you know, ask my pastor what this actually means or look at my decoder ring or whatever it may be. Uh, numbers also have symbolic value and must therefore be read as imagery, okay? So the number seven, typically in, in biblical literature, is a number involving completeness. You know, seven days in creation. Uh, number 12 is also a number of completion. Typically, it's, it's a number of completion involving the purposes of God because there were 12 tribes. And when Jesus reorganized Israel around himself, he didn't pick, you know, six or 13. He picked 12 apostles, okay? Uh, so you're going to see those numbers show up. And, if, and again, if seven is the number of completeness, if God cuts it in half and makes it into three and a half, that's a number of incompleteness. So anyway, so we, we, we can go through all those numbers uh, later if you want to, if you have questions about that. Because uh, understanding what numbers mean, uh, I think, is, uh, is a really, really important part of Revelation. So uh, without being too crude, um, we often talk about if we need to use the restroom as uh, number one or number two. We don't have to explain what that means. We all know. What those things mean. Like we use numbers to symbolize certain things. Um, I need to come up with a better example than that, but that's just um, that's just the example I have. Okay, so apocalyptic literature seeks to convey a specific message from God to its people. Sorry, to His people uh, uh, through the means of heavenly revealers and powerful images. And this is true for the uh, the biblical apocalyptic literature, which the New Testament would be the Book of Revelation, and in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Does anyone know what the, the piece of apocalyptic literature is in the Old Testament? It's the book of 
the book of Daniel. Book of Daniel. What's the difference between regular prophetic literature and apocalyptic literature? Regular prophetic literature is going to have the word of the Lord, the word of Yahweh, the Devar Yahweh, coming to a prophet, and then he speaks to the people. Okay, he's got this word from God. But in apocalyptic literature, there's still a prophet, but it's not the word that's coming to him. He has dreams and visions that come to him. And some of them he can understand, some of them he can't understand, and there's usually an angelic reviewer that comes and explains it to you, and you as the reader get to benefit from that. So a revelation is going to be, it's prophetic, but it's more apocalyptic in that sense, and that's why Daniel is different than Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Okay, let's talk about images. Do we use images today in a way that have meaning, but also are communicated in a way that I don't have to explain to you what that meaning is? And the answer is yes, okay? So you're driving along, you see this, what does this mean? It means go, okay. And if I, if I were to tell you, like, hey, if you're asking me a question, I'm saying, I'm going to give you the green light. That means that I'm, I'm giving you permission to do something, okay? Granted, when we also drive and we see something like this, it doesn't ride it out and say, stop, yield. Someone yesterday said, drive faster, and then go. You know, we just, we're comfortable with this. And no one has to explain this to anybody. We get it. We use, we use images all the time, more often than you think. Okay, what if you see these flashing lights behind you? What does that mean? Pull it means pull over, okay? All right, please don't drive faster, okay? It means, please, it means pull over. Okay, um, but again, I didn't have to tell you that. You know that, okay? <clears throat> this is gonna bring to mind uh, several images. And I'm not going to ask people what they think because people are afraid to tell me what they think about this particular image. But for a lot of people, this has um, imagery involving uh, patriotism, freedom, certain ideals that they think that America should stand up to. And everyone in America recognizes this image, even though it might have a lot of different uh, uh, connotations to them. But I bet 10 years ago, you didn't know what this flag was. Yeah. It's the Ukrainian flag, okay? Um, used to be all over social media, okay? And then uh, we got tired of sending our money that way, okay? Or maybe you enjoy doing that. Depends on what team you're on, I guess. Okay, but you can see this is an image that has a lot of meaning for people today, but 10 years ago, you had no idea what this was, okay? <clears throat> Here's an interesting one. Where do you see this image? On the ambulance. On the, on the ambulance, okay? All right, or if you go into healthcare, it's gonna be on all their badges, and stuff like that. Okay, did you know that this is actually derived from images that were available in the first century from the god Asclepius, okay? And they had Asclepian temples in at least two of the seven ancient churches. And what do you think you would receive if you went to an Asclepian temple? Sorry? Yes, right. You would receive healing. They had, they had hot springs, and you would go there, and you would eat certain foods, and you would sit in the hot springs, and you would get better, Okay. Uh, the early Christians were constantly saying, hey, stop other Christians, stop going to these places, stop going, because in order to do that, you had to honor uh, the, the god Asclepius, okay? But we still use that image today, over 2,000 years later, okay? So that's, that's, a, that's a modern symbol, but also had a healing uh, uh, set of images that are involved even in the first century, and that's relevant to the uh, seven churches. We also use animals to describe different political entities. I'm not endorsing or saying this is wrong. I'm not, you know, it's not mine. It's just the first one that came up in Google. But, uh, you know, different animals represent different political ideologies. The same thing is true in Revelation, okay? The lamb represents, you know, kind of the Christian message, but you have kind of an alternative animal. You have the beast, okay? You have the, the one seated upon the throne, and you have this dragon. You have... Uh, the, the two witnesses, and then you have the, uh, the, the, the false witness, or the, uh, it's actually, the, the, there's, there's a second beast that, that's involved there. So, so we, we still use this today. We still use various animals that signify certain things. And uh, generally, if you're an American, you at least recognize what these are. But if you're not from America, you might not know what these, these mean, okay? Uh, so if we see that sort of animal imagery in the Book of Revelation, uh, we should expect that the original readers would understand that. And they're actually drawing a lot of it from uh, Daniel chapter 7. Who is this? Who is this? Who is it? Okay. It's your teacher? That's nice. Okay. 
Okay, so this is, this is the goddess Nike. The goddess Nike, Latin name Victoria, where we get victory from. What's in our hand right here? Not a trick question. Everyone's really afraid to talk. Okay, it's a wreath. Okay, now when the goddess Nike would grant to you a wreath and put it on your head, what is she symbolizing? Victory. Victory. Okay, you, you are the winner. Okay, you have won the gladiatorial game. You have won the race. You have won the battle. Okay, so if we see images from the first century with people with this on their head, what would we assume? Yeah, they, they're, they're winners. Okay, they're, they're, they've won a particular battle, okay? So let's look at a particular coin. Okay, this was minted in the year 79. This is Vespasian, okay, who was the emperor from 70 to, I think 70 to 79. I think Titus was 79 to 81, and then Domitian was 81 to 96. Um, if I'm wrong, someone will correct me on that. Okay, so uh, this is all in Latin, so don't worry about that. Uh, but you can see right here, what has he got? A laurel wreath on his head, meaning that he is a victor, okay? Uh, he was ultimately in charge of the armies that conquered uh, the Jerusalem temple until he actually basically became uh, the new emperor, and then he passed that on to his uh, son, Titus, one of his sons, who was the general at that time. But on the other side, we have the goddess Roma, okay? And she is sitting on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven mountains, and I'm going to suggest to you that that would have been an image that every single person in the Greco-Roman world that at least knew something about Rome would have been able to recognize, okay? And it's mentioned in the book of Revelation in chapter 17, verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads of this particular beast are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So if you were to read this, seven mountains on which the woman sits... What are those seven mountains? Well, they're the seven mountains that geographically are placed there, bless you, um, upon which the city of Rome was founded, okay? And you can still go to Rome today, and you can still see those seven mountains are still there, okay? That is a known geographical point that everyone in the first century would have understood, okay? If I was to talk today about the American mountain with four faces of rulers on it, we would all know that and recognize that as Mount... Rushmore. We know that. Okay, I don't have to explain that to you. We know that. This would have been a known thing, but if, you, if we don't know our Roman history, if we don't ask how would people have understood these images as a first century person, we're going to miss this, and we're going to miss this particular point. But it identifies, this is not telling you some sort of secret. It's telling you something that everyone already knew, that the woman is the personification of Rome, the goddess Roma. Question. Does America have a symbol that personifies the country as a female figure. There you go, yeah, the other class didn't know it, okay? Lady Liberty, okay, so we still do this today. Still do this today, okay? Now this is kind of the bad city in Revelation chapter 17, like one all the way, all of 17, all of 18, and like the first half of 19. But there's a good city in Revelation from 21.9 through 22.9 that is the city of New Jerusalem. But New Jerusalem is not just a city, it's also the Bride of Christ. Notice the city is a woman, okay? The city's personified as a bride, okay? And early Christians would know that the Bride of Christ is the faithful church, okay? So the church is a city. Well, wait a minute, how does that work? Well, we can, it's, a, you know, in, in, the, in the prophets, they would often describe uh, the people of Jerusalem as Jerusalem, or the people of, the people that live there as Zion. That's just a common way of describing them. Okay, and then of course today we have Nike, today uh, obviously uh, deriving from the goddess Nike. Okay, not endorsing it, saying you shouldn't do it. Nike's not paying me with some tennis shoes to uh, give this promotion here. I'm just saying that uh, uh, the, the image of victory goes back thousands of years. Okay, what does this image mean? Okay, all right. You don't send this to your, uh, your boyfriend or your girlfriend when you like them. Okay, you don't do that, okay? But you know what? We also didn't use this image 10 years ago. This is, it's, a, it's, a, it's an image that has meaning now, but it didn't have any meaning uh, 10 years ago, okay? This is not uh, pudding, by the way. What about this image? Is this guy dancing? He's about to fall. Okay, but I don't have to tell you that. In fact, you actually don't even need the word caution. It's just If you see this on the floor, what do you think? Yeah. Don't walk there, dangerous, wet floor. 
We use images all the time in our culture, right? But I don't have to explain to you what any of them mean. In the first century, Revelation is going to use a lot of images, a lot of symbols, a lot of signs. And it tells you in the very first verse that that's how it's going to communicate its message. And if we could just figure out what those images are, then we can make sense of it, okay? So I'm just I'm trying to, like, ease you into this. Say, so you know what? This, this is something you can do. Like, people think, I can't understand Revelation. Um, yes, you can. You actually can, okay? Uh, like, most, most modern scholars that focus on it say it's actually not too bad. Okay, so, all right. Who, what, when, sorry, who, what, where? We haven't got to the when yet. Where is this? Okay, so here, this is a modern map, uh, Turkey. Um, the ancient region would be Asia Minor. And uh, where is Rome? Rome is like way over here. It's like kind of off the map at this particular point. Where is Jerusalem? Way down here, all right? So Paul did a lot of his missionary journeys over in this area, and of course he would kind of go over here to Greece. He would kind of come up here as well. Um, but Ephesus was a port city, a very, very important port city. I think Ephesus was like, like the third or fourth largest city from a population standpoint in the first century. Million we've studied now. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, compared to Rome and Alexandria, Egypt, and maybe Athens. Uh, I mean, Ephesus was a was a big, big city. And by big, we mean like a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand. Okay, but that's that was big back then, right? <laughs> All right, so uh, they would come in right here, and there was a, this, this sort of like a circular road. It would go from Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, back to Ephesus, which, by the way, happens to be the same order in which the letters to seven churches are actually given because Revelation was written uh, to, you know, to these churches. But obviously, if, if the letter is going to be received by Ephesus, they're going to see, oh, it's written to everyone else, then they're just going to copy it, and they're going to pass it around and— I'm just kind of speculating. Okay, so that's kind of where it is. That's where we are. Okay, so we're not in Rome, which is really important because later in Revelation, it's going to tell you to come out of Rome. And you need to ask yourself the question, what would it mean for someone living here in Philadelphia to come out of Rome? You're thinking, I don't live there. I don't, I don't, I'm not even close to it. It's off the map. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, what does it mean that they are citizens of New Jerusalem when Jerusalem is over here. What does that mean? Something for us to think about. Okay? There's a whole lot we, we could do with that. Okay. All right. When? When was the book of Revelation written? Okay. Um, this, this might be a little technical, but this is me showing you kind of like how scholars look at these ancient works and try to determine these sort of things. Uh, basically, today, there, there are kind of two views that are out there, like, <laughs> One in the 60s and one in kind of like the 80s and the 90s. I'm going to try to convince you of what I think based on, I think, three pieces of evidence, okay? We have a few clues inside the relation that uh, point interpreters to a specific period in history. The first one we'll look at is in chapter 17, okay, uh, where it talks about this woman. Remember, the woman is the woman that sits on the seven hills. It's personification of Rome. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet. Remember we talked about colors? When you see someone clothed in purple and scarlet, is that someone who is poor or is that someone who's rich? Very good. Okay, see, but I didn't have to tell you that. See, you were able to figure that out, okay? The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet. She was adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and unclean things of her immorality. You don't want to drink from that cup. Okay, And on her forehead was a name which was written in mystery, a quotation from Jeremiah, uh, Babylon the Great, the mother of the harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Okay, So that's her way of identifying uh, herself. Okay, um, Is this a positive image or is this a negative image? It's not a trick question. This is a negative image. You don't want to associate with this at all. Okay? All right. So... One of the interesting things here is that, by the way, the woman, personified as Rome, is called Babylon. But Babylon, historically, as a nation, destroyed the first Jerusalem temple in 587 BCE. Okay? Whose temple was that? Who, who built the very first temple? David's fourth son. Solomon. Okay, it's called Solomon's temple. Okay. So Solomon built it around, like, I don't know, 960s or something. We're just guessing and it lasted for about 400 years. That's pretty good. I'd say it's pretty good for an ancient building. Okay, but it was destroyed by the Babylonians. Okay, now they rebuilt it, okay, after the Persians let them come back eventually, after a slow, long period of time. 
And then Rome destroyed the second temple in the year 70. Okay? But Revelation doesn't call Rome Rome. It'll actually call it Babylon. And you can understand why they would give that particular name, Babylon, to Rome. Because Babylon had destroyed their first temple. Rome, Rome destroyed the second temple. So we're just going to call Rome Babylon. We're going to call them that. Okay? That designation only makes sense after the destruction of the temple had taken place. See the logic of that? Like, th this would only have made sense after the year 70. Okay, so that's our first kind of pointer of evidence that we actually have. Number two, okay? Here's the interesting one. This is where we talk about the beast in 666, okay? Uh, you definitely can't leave the class without understanding what 666 means, okay? And you'll be able to impress all your friends. Okay, so here's one, uh, the image of the first beast. I saw one of the heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Okay, so we see the image of a beast that kind of, it dies, and then it comes back to life in a way that amazes a lot of people. And then it says, the number is 666. Okay, remember? Numbers have symbolic value in Revelation. Okay, now... After the emperor Nero committed suicide in the year 68 CE, legends developed that he, that Nero, would return from the dead to take vengeance upon his enemies. Okay? So the idea here is that a certain amount of time needed to have elapsed in order for this sort of legend to have developed, you know, to the capacity that we have there. But we can see some evidence of this legend already in the book of Revelation. They're describing this terrible beast with Nero-like qualities, you know, died, coming back to life, people following him. So we have to think of a, a time period in which that sort of legend would have actually had the amount of time to develop, okay? Now, where do we get the 666 thing from, okay? So uh, I'm sure all of you have made straight A's in your Hebrew class, okay? But just for, just for my sake, I'm just going to go repeat it right here, okay? So we have a noon, a resh, a vav, and a final noon, niron, and then kaisar, okay? Hofsonic resh, okay? And what they did was they would actually take the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and they would assign certain number of values to them. They would start, you know, with the first letter, all of that, gimel, dal, hey. And then we do one, two, three, four, five, we go all the way down to 10. And then from 10, I think they would go from like 10 to 20 to 30 to 40, 50. So they would assign a number value to each of the letters. And if you take the letters for Neron Caesar, they add up to 666, okay? And this is the conclusion that, that most scholars have kind of reached at this particular point, is that we have the picture of an image of a terrible beast who dies and comes back to life, has numbers that add up to the number of Nero Caesar, and they say, oh, it's, it's the terrible qualities of Nero that are being attributed to this particular beast figure, okay? So, that's all that it means. That's all that it means. It's just a, it's just a, it's just a reference to, to Nero Caesar, who committed suicide in which year? 68. 68. Committed suicide in the year 68, okay? Ending the line of the, uh, of the Augustan dynasty, okay? Okay. Uh, giving way for the, uh, the Flavian dynasty. Okay, all right. How many of you, by the way, have heard that before? How many of you have heard that 666 refers to Nero? Okay, if you go online, I guarantee you're gonna find all sorts of ridiculous things. But the question is, do those interpretations have the likelihood of being understood by first century persons? So that's what we're looking at. Okay, so that's the second thing. So, so we, we've already seen that in order for, um, Babylon to be described in a way that refers to Rome. Uh, the destruction of the temple had to have taken place, so that's sometime after the year 70. Nero committed suicide in the year 68. Some legends had developed, so some time needed to have passed from that. And then we also see some evidence of some conflict between the churches and the Jewish synagogue that's down the street, okay? And we see this in two of the seven letters to the seven churches. The first one is in the, the letter to Smyrna, and the second one is in the letter to Philadelphia. The first one, it says, uh, And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write, Jesus talking, The first and the last who was dead and has come back to life says this, I know your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy, 
word for slander. I know the slander by those who say that they're Jews, but they're not. But they're actually a synagogue of Satan. That's kind of a terrible thing to say for modern sensibilities, okay? All right? What's going on here is there's, a, there's kind of a, a redefinition of, like, who are the true Jews? Who are the true people of God, okay? Uh, there's something going on. You know, the synagogue down the street, they think they're a synagogue of God, but from the perspective of this letter, they're being described here as a synagogue of Satan, okay? And you have to be very, really, really careful with, uh, with the anti-Semitism here, uh, but there's a lot of debate, kind of in-house debate between certain Jews, like who's the real Jew, who are the, the false Jews, who are the faithful Jews, who are the unfaithful Jews. That was an in-house discussion among Jewish communities. And the early Christians were you know, Jewish Christian communities, um, at least until uh, there are more Gentiles than Jews. Okay, uh, we see a similar thing here in the Church of Philadelphia. Uh, Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they're Jews, but they're not, but they lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you, okay? Uh, uh, the verb to love, often in the Bible, is a, a sense of choice, you know. Uh, for God to love someone means that he has chosen them, okay? Uh, so uh, we see that the, the Christians in Philadelphia, they have been chosen, and uh, there's the conflict that's going on here, again, is a, a synagogue conflict with the churches, uh, they've actually excavated uh, a large uh, synagogue in uh, Smyrna. So we know there's a large Jewish community that was actually there. Why am I telling you this? What's the point? Here's the point. Before the, the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, which happened in the year 70, the Jews paid a temple tax for the upkeep of the temple facilities. Okay, You can read about this in Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew 17, uh, where they go up to... I think they go up to Peter and say, hey, does your master pay the two draxma tax or whatever it is? Uh, Peter says, you know, sh should we pay this? And Jesus kind of has his back and forth with him, and he's like, okay, well, just so that we don't offend anybody, why don't you go uh, get this fish out of the water? Maybe you're familiar with the story. And like, open the fish's mouth, and it's going to be uh, the, the payment for the tax for you, Peter, and for me. Okay, so Jesus does pay the temple tax. All right. Um, but after the temple is destroyed, where does the money for the temple tax go? Okay. <laughs> the tax was actually collected and used to maintain the temple of Jupiter in Rome, which was one of the oldest temples in Rome. It was like built in around like 500 BC. Okay? Do you think the Jews who were used to giving their money to maintain the temple where they thought the creator God actually lived and resided, do you think they appreciated now taking that money and using it for the upkeep of a pagan temple? No, absolutely not. Okay. So but the Romans knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing, okay? This particular tax was called in Latin the Fiscus Judaicus. Basically, it just means the Jewish tax. Jewish tax, okay? All right. Now, the emperor Domitian, who ruled from 81 to 96, I knew I got that right earlier, he expanded this tax to include those who hid their Judaism or those who lived in a way that appeared Jewish, okay? So, I mean, who has to pay this tax? Jewish people. How do you know who the Jewish people are, okay? Um, well, if you didn't want to pay the tax, what would you do? You might be tempted to hide your Judaism or to not live in a way that appears Jewish. So imagine a scenario here. You've got a Jew that's in the synagogue, and he converts to the Christian faith. He believes the Christian gospel, okay? So he's no longer going to synagogue on the Sabbath. He's now meeting, you know, with the church in Philadelphia, and he's like, okay, I'm not Jewish anymore. I don't have to pay this tax, right? Good for me, okay? But the Jews over here are like, hey, that guy over there, he's a Jew. He's a Jew. He's circumcised. And they call and they point him out and they slander him and they blaspheme him and they create this conflict. This sort of conflict that we see between the churches. I know it's a little complicated. I understand that, okay? But it makes a lot of sense under the heightened level of taxation of the Fiscus Judaicus that it seems that the Emperor Domitian was involved um, kind of like tightening the screws on, okay? A little bit complicated, I understand, um, but uh, again, these are, these are some of the scholarly reasons why scholars are effectively going to date the Book of Revelation nowadays sometime between like the 80s and the 90s CE, okay? I could have just told you all that, but I wanted to convince you, okay? And now you know. That's probably the most boring thing you're gonna hear from me today. Okay, maybe you think it's interesting. I don't know. Okay, but you see this. 
There's a lot of like historical detail we have to go through to like date these 2,000 year old documents. Okay, all right. Who, what, where, when, why? Why was the book of Revelation written? Okay, I mean, in, in, in the New Testament, we've got Gospels, which are Greco Roman biographies. We've got the Book of Acts, which is an ancient piece of history. We've got Greco Roman epistles. We've got whatever you want to call the Book of Hebrews, a sermon, an exhortation kind of sense. That's not really a letter. Um, and then you've got Revelation, an apocalypse. That's also a letter. All right, here's the, the key thing. The visions in Revelation address three primary problems. Three problems, okay? So they're problems that have to be addressed. Okay, number one, accommodation with the Greco-Roman world. Accommodation with the Greco-Roman world, okay? The Christians in those seven churches were more, much more comfortable getting along with the world that's kind of being influenced by the worship of Caesar and, and, and the imperial cult. That, that's another thing we should, we should talk about. Um, we should, we should not have time. We don't have time. Okay. The fastest growing religion in the first century was not Judaism. It wasn't Christianity. It was the imperial cult, which is the worship and the honoring of the Roman emperor and his family and his achievements. Okay. There are 300 temples dedicated to the Roman emperor in the first century. There are not 300 churches. Okay. Cult is not a negative word in religious studies. It's, you know, it's not the thing that you think that your neighbor's in. Uh, it's, it's a neutral word, just means like kind of the religious care. We talk about agriculture, which means the care of the fields. Anyway, so um, anyway, the, the imperial cult was the fastest growing religion, uh, and uh, that influenced a lot of, especially if you were a Gentile that converted to the church, one of the most difficult things you had to do is to give up worshiping all of your gods and to worship one god. That was a, a big, difficult thing for Gentiles to do. And part of that means no longer participating in the imperial cult. You couldn't go to these temples and eat the meat sacrificed to idols. And why would we want the meat sacrificed to idols? Well, we want our we want our free food. We want our free steak. Okay? I mean, how many we all you like hamburgers? I mean everyone wants a Zeus burger. You want an Aphrodite hot dog? Okay? That's you want the free food, the free meat, you know, you go to the temples where they sacrifice these things and you get the free meat. Okay? Everyone wants a Zeus burger. Alright, so here's some of the passages that talk about this. Alright. Uh, but you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Okay? Now, you're intelligent, historically-minded people that understand that Revelation is using imagery. What do you think it means by people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments? Okay. Does that mean that they, you know, need, need a change of diaper? Or does it mean that they haven't they haven't accommodated themselves with the fallen evil culture, and they've kept themselves pure. Okay, Does, you see that that makes sense. Okay, you see that. All right, but you see it, it, it's much more powerful to say that oh, you haven't soiled your garments. So guess what? You're going to walk with me in white. You're going to receive, you know, uh, a, a piece of clothing that indicates God and purity and that sort of stuff. Okay, and of course it demonstrates it's because they're worthy. All right, all right. Here's uh, one of the images uh, describing people that are associated with uh, the Roman culture. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Why? Purpose statement. So that you won't participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. Again, we already asked the question when I had the map up there. What would it mean for people here in Asia Minor to come out of Rome? What does that mean? Does it mean that they pack up their bags? They're not living in Rome. What does it mean to come out of her? It means to stop accommodating with this culture, okay, and to be pure and to live in a pure way, okay? But again, you have to be a citizen of some sort of nation. You're not going to be a citizen of, of Rome or of the way it's described in chapter 17 of fallen Babylon. What are you going to be a citizen of? Then he gives you another vision, the New Jerusalem. Anyway, we can talk about this for a long time. So it's, 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 it's easy to preach out of this book if you understand how that is. Okay, number two. Uh, apathetic attitude towards following Jesus. Their discipleship was terrible. They weren't following Jesus. Okay? Um, how are we doing on our time? Uh, we're good, right? Yeah, yeah. Good. Oh, we're, we're good. Okay, all right. So let me, let me tell you one of the neat things about, about Revelation. Okay, so there is a, uh, there is a term for the word witness in the New Testament. It's the noun martis. Okay? 
And prior to the book of Revelation, a martis is just simply someone who witnessed something. They saw something. They might be called to court to testify about something that they saw, okay? It's also used to describe early Christian preachers. They were witnesses at the end of Luke. It says, you're going to be my witnesses um, beginning in Jerusalem, okay? Um, it's only in the book of Revelation that that word martis starts to become understood as someone who is a martyr, meaning someone who's going to die for that witness. You know how words change over time? It's actually the book of Revelation, which is actually the book that changed the word from just simply being someone who talked about what they saw to someone who's willing to die for their own witness. Okay, So it actually turned into the word martyr. So you'll see in Revelation, Jesus is described as the faithful witness, but in Greek, it's the faithful martyr. And you're a faithful martyr if you preach something in a way faithfully that actually gets you killed. And so you can see Jesus is going to be lifted up as an example because of that. Okay, um, It's a really interesting point about the development of words. Revelation is literally the document in history that changed the word that meant witness to martyr as someone who died for their witness. Okay, so in chapter 2, verse 5, um, this is the, to the church in Ephesus. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent. He's telling Christians to repent. And do the deeds you did at first, or else, uh-oh, or else, I'm coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Twice in one verse, he tells people who are already Christians that they need to repent. Okay? Now, I don't want to scare people a little bit, okay? Um, but there's no church in Ephesus anymore. There's no church in Ephesus anymore, okay? And he tells you earlier in chapter 1 that uh, the lampstand refers as an image for the church, an image of light, okay? Uh, and so some people speculate, uh, did Jesus actually fulfill this? They didn't repent, and he took the lampstand. There's no Christian community in Ephesus anymore. Okay. Um, chapter 3, verse 2, this is to start us. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which are about to die. Why? For I have not found your deeds, your works completed in the sight of my God. Okay? Some Christians are saying, oh, wait a minute. Deeds? I'm not supposed to focus on those. I'm just supposed to worry about faith. Um, you know, the New Testament, Jesus, Paul, and the book of Revelation, they all believe that there's going to be a judgment according to works. Okay, that is a Christian teaching, distinctly Christian teaching. Okay, uh, but you see here, like, they, they have, they need to repent. They need to remember from where they have fallen. They need to wake up. They need to strengthen the things that remain. They need to stop being apathetic in their discipleship. Okay, here's a good one here, chapter 3, verse 21. He who is conquering, the one who is conquering, I, Jesus, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Okay? Let me ask you, what, what is the image, if you, were to, if you were to define this, what do you think is the image of a throne symbolizing? When you see someone sitting on a throne, what does that mean? Royalty. Royalty, okay. Okay, what, what else? Um, power. Power, okay, okay, all right. Uh, so they, they have a sense of influence. Okay, so I'm going I'm to pull out, because I have to use this. It's kind of an object lesson here. All right? <clears throat> so we've got a throne here. Okay. So he's saying, the Christians, if you're conquering, you can sit with me on my throne. So does that mean Jesus is going to, like, sit right here, and you're going to sit right next to him? And all the other Christians are going to sit here, 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 here? That would be to read the imagery too literally. To sit on the throne with Jesus means to share in his rule, to share in his reign. Just as Jesus himself conquered, notice, remember, notice Jesus as the example, he conquered and he sat down with his father on his throne. Jesus now shares in the rule and the reign with his father. Okay, It doesn't mean that there are two people sitting there on one chair. Okay, uh, Again, I think that would be to read the imagery a little too literally, but again, you could decide if you think that makes sense. I mean, do you think Jesus is saying that, you know, millions and millions of faithful Christians are going to be sitting on the same chair with them? I think that, that kind of, that's, again, that's reading the imagery a little too, too literally there. It's to share in his rule, to share in his reign, as, as you already pointed out. Okay, I didn't have to tell you that. All right, so we, we got to be careful of the imagery here, and we can see there are pitfalls to reading the imagery a little too literally. Like, you could read it too literally to the point to where it's absurd, and then you're like, okay, I know I'm doing something wrong. All right. But notice there, he, Jesus calls people to conquer, to overcome, which, by the way, is the verb in Greek, nikao. You hear the word Nike in there? Okay. 
Jesus himself is someone who conquered first. Okay, but Jesus didn't conquer like all the other conquerors. He didn't conquer by shedding the blood of his enemies. In fact, his enemies shed his blood. He didn't defeat his enemies. In fact, his enemies defeated him. So Jesus actually conquers paradoxically, which is actually the title of my dissertation, Paradoxical Conquering in the Apocalypse of John. <clears throat> okay, and number three, uh, they were compromising the commitment to Christian monotheism. We talked about all the different temples you can go to. And uh, again, a lot of Christians, they had a hard time uh, sticking to just simply the worship of one God. And uh, some of the problems are actually being taught and encouraged in the churches. Okay, <clears throat> we're going to have kind of a, a negative image here of a female here, so I apologize. A little trigger warning at this point, uh, but this is, again, part of the imagery that's being used. I have this against you, that you tolerate, literally you forgive, the woman, Jezebel, who's actually a, a, a figure from the Old Testament, so you can see that imagery that's being used there. There's someone in the church, she calls herself a prophetess. What is she doing? She teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and they eat things sacrificed to idol. Immorality in its basic definition just means sexual immorality, sleeping around, okay? However, it also had a meaning in the covenant metaphor of being unfaithful to God, okay? You know, that's, that's why... Well, there's, there's lots of things we can do there. So I don't think that she is saying it's okay to sleep around. I don't think that she's leading that. I think that she's encouraging people to live unfaithfully in their commitment, and their monotheistic commitment. And also they're eating things sacrificed to idols, which means that they, uh, they're participating, they're, they're going to the temples and they're, um, they're participating in these things. So Revelation says, don't do that, okay? So they've, they've abandoned their commitment to Christian monotheism. <clears throat> Here's one of the warnings of it, and I'm going to talk to you about this. I think this is really interesting. I'm going to move over here because I like to move around a little bit. <clears throat> Chapter 14, verse 9. All right. If anyone worships a beast in his image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, okay, um, he will also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in the strength and the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone. Where? in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, I actually think that the, the scariest part of this is not the wrath, it's not the fire. I actually think the scariest part of this is the fact that the punishment is public. Because if you were to think to yourself, what is the scariest thing that could possibly happen to you? It's the fact that you're shamed publicly in front of your peers. That's the biggest thing. So here, notice, it's, it's the, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's the warning, but it's the fact that it's public. It's in the presence of the angels and the presence of the Lamb, and public shame was also a big fear for ancient persons. It's a big fear for people today. Like, no one wants to be shamed. No one wants their private life to be exposed. No one wants their pictures to be out, on, you know, out in the public. Uh, and so this sort of language was meant to dissuade them from compromising and, and worshiping things other than God and the Lamb. Uh, by saying, look, here's what's going to happen, hoping that people will say, I'm not going to do that. You see how practical this is? All right. So yeah, let me just make sure we get, we got all those three things there. Okay. So accommodating with the Gregorian world, answer, live holy, faithful lives, don't associate with fallen Babylon, be a citizen of New Jerusalem. Uh, apathetic attitudes towards following Jesus, um, wake up, repent, follow Jesus, the model, and then... Don't compromise your Christian monotheism. Focus on the one seated upon the throne and on the Lamb. Okay? You see how, I mean, that's, that's much more practical than the way most people teach Revelation, right? Hopefully you see that. Okay. All right. Uh, how should we read the book of Revelation? Okay. <clears throat> okay. No. That's, uh, Revelation was meant to be obeyed. It was meant to be obeyed. It was not meant to just be a, a book of signs and symbols. It was meant to be something that encourages correct Christian discipleship, as hopefully I've been able to demonstrate. Uh, and if you have more questions on that, I've, I've got tons and tons of passages we can look at to make this particular point. I think now that you're kind of clued in on how this works, you can read through it and you can see, okay, yeah, I see it. It's here, it's here, it's here, and, and you're clued into how it works. Okay, so notice the passages that encourage obedience, faithfulness, loyalty. Verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. And what do they do? They heed the things that are written in it, for the time is near. So notice you got, by the way, you got how, how, many, how many readers? There's a singular subject there. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear. Because 
probably in that culture, you know, only one in 20 people would have the amount of education to be able to read and write. You know, literacy rate maybe like 4%, 5%. So one person in the community has enough knowledge to read and write. So they're reading this letter. Everyone else is experiencing it by hearing it, okay? But they're blessed if they heed it, if you observe it, if you keep it, if you obey it. So Revelation was meant to be obeyed. You can't get three verses into it without it telling you that. Chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, this is an image of uh, God on the throne. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne, and they will worship him who lives forever and ever, and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will, they, literally they were, and then they were created. Uh, but again, if you read something like this, what do you think is a practical application? Practical application is that, okay, if this is the vision of what's kind of going on in heaven, and that's supposed to be imitated down here, then yes, we also need to be, you know, casting our crowns, and we need to be um, giving honor and, and glory to God, specifically because he's the creator. He's the creator, okay? So again, if you're, you're hearing this and you're thinking, okay, if he's worthy to be worshipped because he's the creator, why in the world would I want to worship Zeus or Aphrodite or Apollo or whatever it may be, or the Roman emperor, Domitian? <clears throat> Chapter 12, verse 11, another practical passage. And they, the Christians, conquered him, the devil, the fiery dragon. Why? Because of the blood of the lamb. Notice that sacrificial martyr terminology. And because of the word of their testimony, with their preaching. The word of their testimony, okay? The word testimony, by the way, is related to, to martyrdom, martyria, okay? It's, it's the thing that, 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 uh, that witnesses say, okay? And they did not love their life even when faced with death. They were non-violent martyrs. They didn't respond to conflict with the sword. They responded to conflict with non-violent pacifism, okay? So notice, they conquered the dragon not with weapons, not with swords, not with spears, but because of the sacrifice of the lamb, because of their preaching, and they're willing to be martyred. He said that's how you conquer, conquer the devil. Okay? Again, very, very practical, but also you, you start to wonder why people don't preach out this. That sets the bar pretty high for people. You don't like to hear that. But I think it's actually kind of encouraging. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. Chapter 14, verse 14. I don't have to explain that to you. Okay, Following the lamb is just another image of discipleship, wherever he goes. Notice that Jesus functions as the model. Okay, Chapter 19, verse 8. Here's, here's a, uh, another set of images, but I won't have to explain to you what the images mean. Okay, It was given to her, Okay, it was given to the bride, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, and then it tells you what it means. For the fine linen is... The righteous acts of the saints. Okay? So she's clothing herself in righteous acts. Remember? Righteous deeds, good works, those are good. They're encouraged. Okay? So you're supposed to clothe yourself in those. Okay? You're not to accommodate with the fallen culture and soil your garments. You're to live righteously and faithfully, and thereby you're clothed and you're identified with bright, clean, unsoiled garments. Again, very practical, right? Right? That'll preach. That's what they say. Chapter 21, verse 7, uh, he who overcomes, again, that's that conquering word, he who conquers will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Probably the child, so if you're a female, he, he, uh, uh, the, the conqueror will be God's child. That seems to be the father talking. Okay. Uh, so there, again, promise that you're going to inherit all these things, but you, what do you have to do? You've got to conquer. You've got to overcome. Okay? <clears throat> and then at the very, very end of it, Blessed are those who wash their robes. Think to yourself, what does it mean for me to wash my clothes in the context of Revelation? Why? Purpose statement. So that they may have the right to the tree of life, and they may enter by the gates into the city. This is the city of New Jerusalem. Okay? Outside of the city, present tense, are dogs, sorcerers, and immoral persons, and the murderers, and the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. He's saying right now, outside of the city, that's where those people are. If you want to get into the city, what do you have to do? Wash your robes. Repent. Live faithfully. Stop accommodating. And then you can come out. Remember, come out of Rome. Come out of her. And then here you have the invitation to come in to the other city. Don't be a citizen of fallen Babylon. Be a citizen of New Jerusalem. Okay? You see how it works? 
Very practical, very, very practical. Okay, so how do people typically read Revelation? There are basically four different um, lenses. Uh, the first one is called futurist. Uh, futurists are people that uh, they think Revelation is going to predict events leading to the end of the age that can be placed on some sort of timeline. They'll basically say Revelation is just typically written, history written in advance. Okay? And they're going to come to the text with this sort of way of reading, and they're going to say that's how we're supposed to read Revelation. Very, very popular in, uh, in evangelicalism. Okay? What are the positives of this sort of reading? Well, it does take seriously the visions of a future kingdom. We didn't get to talk about that too much. Okay? It talks about the day of judgment, which is still future, the resurrection of the dead, uh, which is future, and the destruction of the wicked. Yeah, so it, it notices that those are still future, unfulfilled events. But the cons, unfortunately, is that it divorces Revelation from its historical context, and it makes its message irrelevant to the readers of the last 2,000 years. You have a message that's encouraging people in Asia Minor in the first century to focus on their monotheism, to be faithful in their discipleship, and to not accommodate with Rome. But if you take all those images and you say, no, that just refers to the future, then why in the world did the original recipients cherish it, value it as scripture, copy it, transfer it? So there's some problems with at least, there's, with at least the abuse of the futurist view. Preterist this is the opposite. Revelation is already fulfilled. Some of them will say it's, it was fulfilled as early as the year 70. What's the problem with that? They have, they have to date Revelation to way before the time when our evidence is pointing that it was actually dated. Okay? So that's, that's, that's one of the problems with that. So if a futurist is going to say all of Revelation is still in the future and it still needs to be fulfilled, uh, preterism is the opposite extreme. It's going to say it's already been fulfilled. All of it's been fulfilled. Pros, well, it's, it, okay, yeah, it's going to take seriously the original context of the seven historical churches, kind of, sort of, but it actually ignores the return of Jesus to consummate the kingdom of God, which I think most Christians would say has not happened yet. Um, you know, depends on your Christian tradition, assuming you're a person of faith at all. Okay, uh, you know, I think pretty clearly Christians have not said that Jesus' return and the resurrection hasn't taken place and the day of judgment hasn't taken place. Okay? All right, uh, the historicist view. Okay, I know like three people alive who who believe this. Like this is a dying sort of thing. Like it's like I think I own like ninety one commentaries on Revelation, and I don't think any of them are are pushing this anymore. It's like it's it's a, it's an old view, uh, but they're basically saying that Revelation is read as an ongoing history, um, often by the way of the Catholic Church. Okay, so that so they're what what historicists will say is that Rome. This terrible thing is not just Rome the city. They'll say it's the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? So, <clears throat> would historicists be Catholic interpreters or would they be Protestant interpreters? Answer, they would be Protestant interpreters. Okay? All right. Um, but, so, but you can see there's, there's problems with conflating an ancient city in the first century to the Roman Catholic Church, which, uh, you know, it's, I think, might not have been understood that way at least for a few centuries later. Um, I'm not the resident Catholic, so, but um, you can see where there's obviously problems with that. <clears throat> um, pros, well, they, they certainly are going to value history in, in some sort of capacity. They're trying to see how Revelation just kind of unfolds over time. It's kind of this unpacking history. Um, but they conflate Roman society with the Roman Catholic Church, and they're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and then the idealist. Interpretation. Revelation should just be read as symbolically telling timeless truths. Timeless truths. Okay. Well, it does take seriously the symbolism. That's good. It's a good thing. We've already seen that. But it, again, it just divorces Revelation from its historical context and it ignores the return of Jesus. Okay. So the best approach is to take all of the pros and make that into an approach and to not have any of the cons. You know, take all the good stuff. You know, basically, focus on the history. This is what I wrote at the end. So, the consensus of modern Bible scholars is to read Revelation as addressing the seven churches in Asia Minor while also admitting that the end has not arrived. Okay. All right. Hey, that's Revelation in an hour. Okay. Which is uh, a proof in and of itself that miracles do exist. Any questions or comments or anything that I left out of your 
I, I'm sorry if I didn't read your favorite passage. 